Hello, my name is Dan Gibson and welcome to this new video series, Talking with Dan Gibson. This series has two uh, different uh, purposes. The first one is for me to uh, share with you, the readers or the viewers, of uh, different topics that I'm studying or researching or introducing the different resources that are available. Second, I'd like to have this series to answer questions that people have asked and try to respond back to uh, different, especially some of the good questions that are being asked out there. And I've been thinking now those would make a good topic for a YouTube video. So please uh, feel free to write me. The email address is at the bottom of the screen and also in the notes on YouTube. And you can uh, email me and write to me. I ask that you would please write short emails. I don't have time to read pages and pages of material. I'm looking just for topics that I can speak about. So if you would like to suggest a topic, I would be uh, interested in hearing those and responding back to you about that. Now, everybody has a different view of history. We all see it through our own eyes and through the things we've been exposed to. So I ask you when you write your question to, to think carefully. Please be aware of the books that I've written, of the video that uh, this is all about, the video called The Sacred City. And if you've read the books or seen the film and you still have questions, those are the questions I'd like to hear. I don't want to be repeating over and over again the things that are already in the books or in the video. Um, that uh, would make it much easier and we don't want to bore other people who have already uh, done the research and, and read or watched the film. Now, when you ask a question, please don't just assume things. I often get questions and it's very difficult to know how to answer that. For instance, uh, one question someone raised, he said, well, since the Nabataeans were just camel herders, how did they navigate by the stars and how did they travel the world like you claim? Now, that may sound like a simple question, but there are lots of uh, bits to it and it, you, I could spend, I could write three books on that topic. The Nabataeans were simple camel herders is how the question started. So the, the writer assumed something, assumed that without actually having done the research to find out who were the Nabataeans and what were they and how did they uh, conduct their uh, business and so forth. And were they mere camel herders or did they have other traits and things that they did? So that's an assumed part of the question. And then they ask, how did they navigate by stars? That's already covered in the book, uh, uh, Early Islamic Qiblas. That is explained there. There are several pages that, that cover that, and that's been published in a number of different places. And uh, then lastly, that uh, how did they travel the world? And uh, I have written a bit on that in different places. I might want to address that question. But uh, please keep the question simple. I, I can't just do pages and pages of material. So I'd like to just uh, deal with one topic at a time that will make it much easier for everyone. Now, a second thing I've run into is people assume that I don't know anything, that I have just am ignorant, and therefore when I make a suggestion, oh, that guy's ignorant. I, I face a lot of that, and I understand that, because you've uh, perhaps uh, been involved with Islam or the Middle East or the Arabian Peninsula for many, many years. And when a new idea comes along or a new uh, top or new thing is suggested, you immediately react. And I would react the same way. Oh, that's crazy. That's very strange. That's a normal reaction. And I expect that from people. So I understand that. But I wanted to explain in this introductory video that um, I have studied Islam. I have studied Middle Eastern history. I have studied the Arabic language. I have a library of thousands and thousands of uh, books and volumes and academic articles. I have access to a, a, an incredible amount of academic material on many other related topics as well. And so what I say may be different from what you've heard from someone else, but I'm not saying it out of ignorance. 
I've been looking, reading, and researching, trying to find out what really happened in Arabia during the lifetime of Muhammad. What happened before, what happened during his lifetime, what happened immediately afterwards. Those are the areas of research that I'm very, very interested in. And so I'm not ignorant of Islamic history and of is Islamic uh, studies. Now, some people hear the, the topic, oh, you say, you know, Muhammad was from Petra, and they immediately react against it. And I understand that. But uh, it would be easier if they, first of all, watch the film, and second, if they would read uh, the book, either ge uh, Quranic Geography, or if they read uh, Early Islamic Kiblis, and those books explain an awful lot of the data and where I've got things from and how I came up with these ideas. So my purpose in these videos is not to repeat things that have already been researched and said. It's not to, um, uh, you know, represent so you, now you don't have to watch uh, the video or you don't have to read the books because you've watched the YouTube clip. No, the YouTube clips are here to add to what already has been said and to introduce new topics. So please um, make yourself uh, available to the books. You can look online, uh, many of the materials you can just download and you can uh, have check that out and see what I've written before. Now people have uh, asked the question, who is Dan Gibson? Who is this guy? Well, I'm just like you. I'm searching for truth. I've uh, started out a long time ago wondering what uh, happened in Arabia many years ago. Uh, so I've been studying the Arabian Peninsula since I was very young and that has been something that's captivated me and has been the main topic of my research over the years. Now I grew up in a house that was very different from other people. Um, I grew up in Canada, an English-speaking house. Uh, my parents were from English and German background. I'm not an Arab. I, I knew nothing of Arabia uh, at the early stage. But in my home, I had a grandfather and I had a father who were captivated by Middle Eastern history and archaeology. And so we had a house full of books, books and journals that my grandfather and my father had collected over the years. Books from the 1800s, books from the 1900s, books from the 20th century. So just a lot of early, early uh, materials that were gathered together. And I grew up surrounded by these books and spent a lot of time reading and looking at them and wondering and trying to figure things out. And I'm talking about here, I'm 9, 10, 11 years old. So uh, I'll just give you a few examples of some of the things. Um, over here, I'll grab one of these. This is called The Biblical Archaeologist. Uh, this was published back, uh, this particular edition, this is uh, 1959. And uh, if we look through this book here, uh, we find all kinds of different articles on pottery in the Middle East and some aerial photographs uh, even at the time. And uh, amazing articles, if you look through this, there's articles in here by Nelson Gluck. There's also Ernest Wright has articles in there and so forth. So these are the early ideas, early research, some of the surveys that were being taken. We got these books as they were happening. So the journals that came out look small, uh, but they came out regularly. So there were journals there. We also um, got other books. Here is one called Picturesque Palestine. And uh, this is uh, an interesting book by uh, a man who went out before the time of cameras. And so he drew pictures and researched. He walked all through the Middle East. So you'll find pages and pages of articles, uh, a lot pages of articles, lots of different things that he saw as he traveled. And so uh, there are several volumes that he has in his history, uh, in his uh Travels through the Middle East and uh, very interesting stuff uh, from uh, a long way back. Um, then there are archaeology, archaeological reports. Here's an archaeological report on uh, an expedition to the Near East. This one is on the Lakish letters. And uh, this goes through the letters that were found at the Lakish uh, site and uh, pages of uh, pictures of the actual uh, shards of pottery and the writing that were on them or the 
or uh, the different materials that were used and uh, then the, there's a picture of uh, what it looked like and then the actual uh, transliterations on the next page and this goes on for pages as we go through the early letters that were found and all the different uh, things we can learn from these letters so uh, we have uh, I have on my shelf other uh, books about uh, different archaeological uh, uh, excavations that were done and different uh, uh, writings that took place. So I grew up in a home that had all of this stuff in it and uh, I inherited this and nobody else in the family was interested so I was the next generation who came along and I inherited all this material and grew up reading it and studying it and so forth. I went off to college and studied in college and then when I was uh, uh, a young man I just uh, married uh, my wife and we headed off to the Middle East in uh, 1979 to uh, study the Arabic language and I studied uh, it took me a long time I, I spent a long time studying Arabic I did a year and a half course uh, initially and then went out and got involved in some things and realized I need to put more time into Arabic. So a couple years later I went back and did more studies altogether. I think about three years of intense study of just the Arabic language. Studying um, how to speak, how to write, how to read, studying Arabic grammar and all the different bits and pieces of Arabic grammar and how it all put together. Um, and during that time, uh, we, we moved to different places. We lived in a lot of different countries. Uh, we lived in the Gulf states for a while, we, uh, the United Arab Emirates. I lived in Yemen for a number of years, did work there. Uh, and I traveled through Saudi Arabia different times, uh, through um, Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, all these different countries. Everywhere we went, um, I was interested in learning trying to figure out how do people think, how do they see the world. Much of what I uh, am interested in is how did people see the world back in ancient days, how do they see the world now, how do people see the world, and, and why do they think differently from other people. We spent uh, some time living out in a village with Bedouin, some time being about three years. Uh, learning about and living with and walking with and talking with the Bedouin people and trying to understand their their worldview, how they see things, and applying that to history. How can I read uh, about and study the Nabataean people who came out of a, a Bedouin background, a nomadic background, and these camel herders as we call them, and uh, how did they end up building a massive city like the city of Petra with beautifully carved monuments? What was important to them? How do you take the mindset of a Bedouin and how does that turn into the Nabataeans who built the city of Petra? And so trying to get into the mindset of people was probably my, my major focus as well as the history and who they were and so forth. Much of what I did, I learned from people as well as from books. I found that people are a very rich resource. Everywhere I went, I enjoyed sitting with people, especially older men. I discovered older men, have, uh, they, they've got so much that they know about. You know, you can go and get them talking and start hearing the stories and uh, amazing stories that, that they remember. There are the chronologies of the tribes. Who knows the tribes? There are the poets in each of these tribes. There are men who know the poetry and can sit there and recite back over and over all the different things that, that went on back in history. And then there are the observations they have in daily life. Men who remembered being out in the desert. Men who remembered uh, many things that when I've met, talked to men who remembered Glub Pasher and remembered Lawrence of Arabia and so forth. So there are many, many different um, uh, memories that are there. Some of them are recent and some of them ancient memories. And the wisdom of the desert. What are the plants? What are their names? How are they used? What is the... Um, uh, how do you take uh, uh, some animals and go out into that barren desert? And how do you survive? How do you find water? How do you navigate? How do you know which way is home? So many different things we can learn just by sitting with the men. 
but I'm also a student of archaeology and history. And so I read books and I talk to scholars. I've met many scholars and I'm searching for truth, trying to understand and put together what happened in Arabia during the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad. And sometimes the things we discover when we find some truth Sometimes it hurts because we've assumed something else. We've learned something else from others, and truth can be a bit offensive, sometimes hard to take. So check, double check everything. The, the reason for the books and the films and these YouTube videos is I want you to check what I found. I want you to uh, look at the things that I say, double check everything that I say. When I quote the Quran, Check me, make sure it's right. When I quote a hadith, check me, make sure it's right. When I talk about a mosque or a location, check it. I'm not trying to manipulate things, but don't just trust me, because if you just start to trust everybody what they say, you will find yourself being pulled this way, and then being pulled this way, and then being pulled this way. Rather, check it out for yourself. I'm not trying to twist things up, I'm trying to untwist them. And I'm making these videos to help you untwist some of these things in your mind. My goal is to try to make this as simple as possible. To try to take what I've been finding and make it available to everyone. Because I'm searching for truth. You know, when we start to, to search for truth, we begin to question things. We begin to ask questions. And sometimes our leaders don't like us to ask questions. I remember asking a question to a man who was telling me a lot about this. Well, where did you learn this? Oh, he said, I got this from my teacher. Oh, that's wonderful. Where did your teacher learn this? Oh, he learned it from his teacher. And where did that teacher learn it from? Oh, he got it from his teacher. Okay, so as things get passed down, I've noticed that something happens. That sometimes somebody forgets a little bit. And so the, the next person only knows a little bit less, and the next person a little bit less, because each teacher sometimes forgets to add things. Also, sometimes a teacher wants to clarify things or illustrate things, and so they add an illustration, or they clarify it by adding something to it, and then the truth grows and it grows. So some things are shrinking and some things are growing and the truth can change. Perceptions can change. That's why archaeology is so important. We need to go back and look at the actual bricks and the actual stones and the old buildings and learn from them. What do they tell us? And if they tell us a different story, then we need to begin to put together all the things that everyone said it means reading a lot of different books. It means going to all these different sources and trying to put together what really happened in Arabia during the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad. What happened just before that made up his world? What happened after he impacted the world? And try to deduce for ourselves what is truth, what is really happening here and search for truth. So that's uh, what I want to leave you with during this introductory video. Who is Dan Gibson and the search for truth. So thank you for watching Talking with Dan Gibson and uh, there'll be more videos in this video series soon. Thank you.